Welcome to the show that puts you at the centre of the national conversation, talking about the issues that matter to you the most. Tonight, get ready for Rishi. Mr Sunak will be Britain's next Prime Minister. After an incredible turn of events, he secured the votes of more than half of all Conservative MPs. But the party remains divided. What's next for Britain? Bruised and battered by these past exhausting weeks. I'm Trevor Phillips, and this is The Great Debate. Each week, we get to the heart of the issue, dominating the headlines. Britain's new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has pledged to bring his party and the country together in the face of profound economic challenge. While the Conservatives may want to dismiss the last few weeks as a fever dream, but it's now time to get down to reality and the difficult business of government. As usual, our viewers panel from across the country and indeed across the world will share their experiences, they'll have their say. And here in the studio, Health Minister and Rishi Sunak supporter, the Conservative MP Robert Jenrick, the shadow leader of the Commons, Bangham Debonair, Senior Research Fellow of UK in a Changing Europe and former civil servant Jill Rutter, and the Times columnist and publisher of Reaction, Ian Martin. The big question tonight, Britain's next Prime Minister, are you ready for Rishi? Rishi Sunak is therefore elected as leader of the Conservative Party. Let's begin, as we always do, with our viewers' panel and talk to Christine, Christine Robertson in Market Drayton. Good evening, Christine. What's your Good evening, thought? Trevor. What's your feeling this evening? Um, I feel like we're witnessing political deception by the Tories and the 1922 committee to stay in power and avoid a general election. The Tory party split. The rest of the country did not have a chance to vote. Rishi Sunak has no mandate and we need honesty and integrity urgently. Not more chaos and psychodrama. Jan, uh, Christine, thank you so much for that an unambiguous point of view. Let's go and see if um, we can find another point of view. Let's talk to Janet, Janet Cohen, who's in Crouch End in North London. Janet. Good evening, Trevor. I am pleased that Rishi is the new Prime Minister. He has the mandate in terms of the Conservative MPs. He has the economic know-how. I am happy with a Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt coalition. Penny Mordaunt was just too similar to Liz Truss, and she even endorsed Liz Truss's economic strategy. Um, this is going to be good, especially if he takes a diametrically opposed course to his prede predecessor, Kwasi Kwarteng, and put the weakest, poorest, Okay. And those who are struggling at the grassroots okay. with the cost of living at the forefront of his policies by avoiding austerity and embracing better okay. and enhance public expenditure, especially for schools, hospitals okay. and public service oh. generally. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Janet. A very different point of view. Let's, um, let's go to Paul Johnston. Paul, I think you've got a question for our panel I, I have, Trevor. Good evening. Yes, yeah, so um, I believe that the Conservatives have become a bit of a shambles. Um, we can't keep going on like this. Um, too many changes and we need some stability. Um, and to be honest, that, that really means Labour now. Um, if it was a business, it's been so bad, you'd probably shut the business down, uh, talking as a business person. So my question is, isn't it time for a general election? Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I, I would normally come in to talk to our panel, but before I do that, I want to see where, what our viewers' panel thinks, what the feeling is in the country, as it were. Paul has asked, is it time for a general election? 
Um, now, we talked about this last week, didn't we? And there was a point of view, which I'll replay in a second, but let's see what you think tonight. Those who are in favour of a general election now or very soon, please raise your hands. And we're going to pan along and see what we're getting from. We are seeing a lot of hands there. I think last week it was something like 60-40. It looks to me like there are more people who want a general election now. All right, Let, let's um, put this to our panel. Paul's question is, isn't it time for a general election? Thangam Debonair, why don't you surprise me with your view on this? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's a time for a general election. It's absolutely the time for election because we've had months, as I think Christine and Janet both said in their different ways, of a psychodrama, of chaos, but also, most importantly, people who've been struggling to see how they're going to get through the winter, how they're going to manage to both heat their homes and feed their families, if they're going to be able to, to manage to pay their rent, their mortgage. Now, with all of that, and what's the Tory party, the governing party, been doing? They've been fighting amongst themselves. <clears throat> They've been squabbling over who's going to be the, whose turn it is this week to be Prime Minister. It's just not good enough. We need stability. And in order to have stability, we need a Labour government. The only way we can do that is to have a general election. OK, Robert Jenrick, I don't expect you to say we need a Labour government, but what about the general election? I don't think that's the right answer. Uh, the Conservative Party was elected in 2019. Our mandate comes from that general election and the manifesto on which we were all elected. And what Rishi Sunak said today very clearly is that he intends to govern according to that manifesto. And the principles on it were that we would spread opportunity to all parts of the country, that we would work to preserve and protect the NHS and public services, that we would bear down on immigration, be strong on defence. And I, I don't, for one minute, argue that it hasn't been a regrettable period. I think it has been. As a Conservative, I'm embarrassed about some of the events of the last few weeks. There's a big task for us now to rebuild trust and confidence amongst the general public I do think, knowing Rishi Sunak extremely well, that we now have somebody, or will tomorrow, at the helm, who is a very serious person, a mature, professional leader for this country, who will address the questions that Christine and others have already said. All right. I'm going to come back to you, but let me, let's just check with Paul. Um, Paul, you've, you've heard what Robert Jenrick has to say. Are you persuaded that this is not the right time, that we've got... We should have other priorities right now. It's definitely the right time. Um, you probably won't believe this, but I actually did vote for the Conservatives. But I just think um, it's just been such a disaster. You just can't believe a word they say, and I just won't, wouldn't vote for them. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, Jill Rutter, um, we probably haven't been in exactly this position before, but w what is the formal position? We don't need a general election because we've got a new Prime Minister, but what's happened in the past? No, because we've got a parliamentary system, the Conservative Party still has a majority of around 70, so we will only get a general election if either Rishi Sunak, for some reason, decides as Prime Minister that he needs to go and renew his mandate. Remember, we had those debates when Gordon Brown took it over from Tony Blair, whether he should go for an election or not. And actually, in some ways, the fact that he didn't go for an election then was seen as a bit of a, a, bit of a sort of loss of face, actually, because he marched everybody up the hill and then decided not to call an election. Theresa May took over in similar circumstances after David Cameron resigned. She originally said she was going to rule out an election, then decided to go, go for it in 2017 to improve, mm. she thought, her position in Parliament. Obviously, that... That didn't work, so there's no necessary thing. So we only get a general election either if Rishi Sunak decides to call one or if Thangham, Thangham's party can persuade sufficient Conservatives that they're so disaffected and share Paul's view that they vote with Labour in a no-confidence motion and the government falls. Ian Martin, um, what do you think? Should Rishi Sunak just say... I want my own mandate. I think, as you can see from the strength of feeling tonight, the Tories are going to be really lucky to get away with this idea that they don't have an election, such as the, the shambles and the disaster of the last... It's not just the last few, few days that have been very stressful, but just what they've inflicted on the country in the, for the last year. I do, on the other hand, though, think that it's a bad idea immediately now 
because I think the international situation is so precarious and the economic situation is so precarious that I don't think a six-week general election campaign is a particularly good idea. And I think the country has to... I think Rishi Sunak is going to have to level with people about how difficult the winter is going to be on the economic front, on, in terms of the war and the, and the energy crisis. But I think by the time you get to the spring, through the other side of it, I think they will have to hold an election. That's an interesting point, though, Robert Jenrick. Maybe not now, but don't have to wait till January, uh, December 2024, do you? Uh, the Prime Minister could choose to, to go sooner than that, but I think I was going to concur with Ian that when Rishi Sunak makes his remarks outside Downing Street tomorrow, I think he needs to be very frank and honest with the public about the scale of the challenge that he faces as Prime Minister, we face as citizens of the country, the economic context, the challenge to the public finances, the stress that public services are under as they're still in the long shadow of okay. COVID. And I think that's the message that he will deliver, one of honesty, straightforwardness okay. and seriousness of purpose in trying to tackle them and, and restore okay. public trust in the government by being seen in time to be a highly competent and professional government. All right. Stephen Gilligan, I think. Um, Stephen and Dumbarton. Um, Robert Jenrick's just pointed out that the Prime Minister-to-be to will appear on the steps of Downing Street tomorrow... What do you want to hear from him? Well, to be honest with you, Trevor, I, I, as I said, I, I, I'm looking for a general election. And really, I'm looking for some stability, some sort of order. I was asked today if I was pushed, would I have voted for a Sunak or Modern? And it's just because it favoured the markets. I think for people with mortgages and people who are worried, then this would completely calm the, the markets down. But to be honest with you, this chap was rejected by the party six or seven weeks ago. So this is a plaster over a sore. It won't stop the eternal bleeding in the Tory party. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, thank you, Debonair. You know, there's the support for your position here. But in reality, why would a general election actually solve the scale of the problem that Robert Jenrick's been talking about. Why now, given what's going on internationally, surely a general election will lead to less stability rather than more stability? Well, I think it's going to depend what Rishi Sunak comes up with. I think something's been very remarkable about ah, this leadership Ah, so you're willing candidate. to give him a chance? I've, well, partly because we don't actually know what he's going to do. The man has been virtually silent over the last week or so, and I, we, we've not heard anything from him even during this official leadership contest. I don't think there's anything he's going to be able to offer that will bring stability to this country because he's been part of propping up a, a government led by someone who was shown to have broken the law and is still under investigation for misleading possibly a misleading parliament. He did that earlier on this year. He has failed to take responsibility when he was Chancellor for that emerging crisis, partly caused by Ukraine, okay. with it, people's energy bills. I mean, I think we, we okay. have to look at his track record, but also look at the fact he's told us nothing about what his plan but is. But you haven't said why you think it'll make... you told me why the Tories are bad, but you haven't told me why General Election Because we do have a plan. So what we've got at the moment okay. from the next uh, Prime Minister is a man who's had no plan, who doesn't show okay. any understanding of what people are actually going through, and seems to have no way of dealing with what they're going through. Okay. Now, Keir Starmer, on the other hand, does. All right. We have to go to break. This is The Great Debate. Up next, the United Kingdom has been ridiculed around the world over the past few weeks. Can Rishi Sunak repair the damage done to Britain's standing on the global stage? Well, with three prime ministers in just 50 days, the UK's reputation around the world for stability is taking a battering. Rishi Sunak's experience in international finance may help him, but he'll need to work pretty hard to repair the damage of the past few weeks. He does start with some unique advantages, of course. His appointment has been immediately well-received in India, and he's already secured his place in history by becoming the first non-white British Prime Minister, though he's also the youngest since 1812. Now, I want to talk to Colette, uh, Colette Osborne in Nottingham. Good evening, Colette. Good evening, Trevor. What are your thoughts this evening? Um, well, I represent the hair, barber and beauty sector, many businesses across the UK with the hair and barber councillors. We're not regulated. And along with the whole of the UK at the moment, we're all pulling our hair out. Um, this chaos, um, political party politics, um, businesses can't afford the bills, 
jobs are and will be lost and people's lives are being ruined. And frankly, I'm embarrassed to be British. I really am at the moment. We're the laughing stock of the civilised world. Um, you know, I've met Rishi myself, um, you know, as I said last week on this programme, if anybody can actually get the conservatives out of the hold of the dog, it will be him. But what I want to know from the, from the panel and from anybody, when will the government put the country first and their own personal gain second? We've all put that question, Colette. Oh, you, you, you've had the good fortune that most people haven't had, which is to re meet the, the, the next Prime Minister. Did he inspire you? I mean, you said you thought he could, he could do the job, but did he, did he inspire you with confidence or... There's a terrible gag I'm about to make. Uh, did he leave you tearing your hair out for, as a beautician? Well, you know what? <laughs> well, as a hairdresser, look, you know, we, we... the thing is, he did give me confidence. Um, what he did do is, is something that I've not seen any politician do yet, which is engage with our sector and actually come in and listen to small business. And I actually had this conversation with him. Everybody says, you know, he's a billionaire and he's rich and he doesn't need to do this job. But let's consider this. If he's doing this job, He's doing it because he cares, and that really came across to me. Um, so, actually, I have every confidence in him to actually get us out of the hole we're in. Um, you know, the markets rebound today um, as soon as it was announced. And if it, and if it doesn't work, but I think the, the only way Rishi will fail is if the Conservative Party do not stop their backbiting, and this means Labour as well. Okay. Can you all just stop and put the country first, please? OK, okay thank you, Colette. Um, Robert Jenrick... Stop the backbiting. Absolutely. The Conservative Party needs to unite around Rishi now and give him its full support. I think what Colette said was interesting, that Rishi is somebody who I think you can have confidence in. I think he is a very honest and straightforward person. You saw in the summer, in the first iteration of our leadership contest, Rishi didn't tell the Conservative Party membership exactly what it wanted to hear. It didn't say... He didn't say fairy tales about the state of the economy. Everything he said in the summer has been proven to be correct. I think that gives you a sense that he's willing to say the truth. He wants to be an honest, straightforward person. The other thing I'd say is that he is somebody who I think will represent us well on the international stage. As Chancellor, he was excellent at building links with the United States okay. and others. He created, for example, the economic sanctions together with Janet Yellen, his opposite number in the US, which but, has put a lot of pressure on Russia. I, so he's well known I'm, on the international I'm, I'm, I'm stage. Hearing, I think we'll do that well. I'm, I'm hearing about Rishi Sunak's virtues. But what uh, Colette's question was really about is, will the Conservative Party stop... And this, this is not my language, but stop fighting like a bunch of weasels in a sack. Well, it's got, some it's, of your, it's got some of your colleagues keep saying we want unity, and the next thing they do is bang in a letter to, to uh, get the leader to resign. Well, look, last week I said that I thought this was an existential moment for the Conservative Party. Either we handled this well, chose the best person for the job in the national interest, not just who we would like or who is our friend, and then got behind them genuinely. We have to do that. If we don't do that, then we won't deserve to be elected at the next general election. Today I saw my Conservative colleagues applauding Rishi's appointment. I hope that that will be followed up in the days yeah. and weeks to come with genuine support so that we can get on with the job of governing the country and looking out for the interests of people like Colette and her business. Now, there's quite a lot of applause uh, from our uh, viewers on that. But just very briefly, Ian Martin, you, you follow this a lot. Uh, uh, suddenly, is it going to suddenly change? I'm not sure if it's going to change, but I think they now, the Tories, should really just forget about the next general election and start focusing on the country and start trying to repair the damage internationally. We now have a terrible image problem internationally. The markets need to be reassured. I do think it's relatively optimistic that you feel it's not going to be Boris Johnson. We lived through that 72-hour okay. horror story of it possibly being the idea that this um, lunatic was going to try and be Prime Minister again after all the damage that he's done. And Sunak is... Lunatic is quite strong language, but is, let's, is quite, let's go with it. Well, I'm just astonished that he even thought that he would try again. But you have someone in place who is relatively calm, technocratic. Um, I do think he will have to have an election at some point. But you know that I think you can broadly trust him um, okay. to do a competent job at a very, very difficult time uh, internationally. Jill, Jill there, there, there's another part of this whole operation, which is governments are not just the MPs. There are, whatever it is, 400, nearly half a million 
civil servants and also public bodies. Do you think um, Whitehall is breathing a sigh of relief or is it sitting there in trepidation thinking what next? Well, Whitehall likes stability in ministers. It finds it difficult to cope when you don't know from one week to the next who's going to be your minister. You like ministers who listen to advice. They don't have to take it, but... Uh, but you do like to think that they've given you a decent hearing for what you want to say. So that's one of the things that's uh, really important. And I think, actually, in Rishi Sunak did have a good reputation from the way he worked with his officials at the Treasury. So I think that's quite a positive. He's come in, I think, saying quite interesting things in his statement today about restoring integrity, accountability and professionalism. And I think people will be looking for that okay. and would welcome some of that. But I think what you really want is a united cabinet that can give a clear direction to the civil service. Otherwise, it's an incredibly difficult, near impossible job to do. OK, Bangham Debonair, that's your worst nightmare, isn't it? That they might actually look competent. Surely what you like is prime ministers who are rocky, uh, conservative prime ministers, I should say, who are rocky, who are always in the newspapers, who people think are on their way out. Uh, Rishi Sunak doing what Jill and Robert Jenrick said would be the worst possible thing for you. Absolutely not. We believe in country first and party second. Keir set that out, uh, Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, at our conference in his, his keynote speech. Country first, party second is a very important principle to Keir and to us in the Labour Party. And we do that because we actually want the country to succeed. We want people like Colette, we want her business to succeed. We want it to do well. But I think the proof will be in the pudding. As I've said, we've not really heard from Rishi what he's going to do differently from what he set out in the summer. And it is, unfortunately, okay. a very different country now. In order to establish our standing on... re-establish okay. our standing on the world stage, there are various things that he could do. We've yet to hear if he's going to do them. I think he could do well to start by appointing an independent ethics advisor, which the previous two prime ah. ministers seem to dismiss as completely irrelevant. Okay, and I think that's a really important well, well, way of I, I, re-establishing an that ethical question. heart of government. Rishi has yes. been very clear that he will appoint an independent advisor. And about time too. And so you'll, but, you'll see I, that very quickly. But in amongst all this party mm. politics, mm. I think it needs to be understood how serious the situation mm. yes, is with exactly. the markets. Now, what the Trussites did was to make Britain an outlier, but there are all sorts of problems across the global markets, and that was just the first explosion. So the, the new government needs... We all need it to be successful in terms of restoring some kind of economic order, reducing okay. borrowing costs. And, and, and we'll, you, can, right. you can have we, confidence we, we in that, because Rishi we, we, predicted we, that would happen, we, we did and you've spend, already seen the markets we, starting we, we to We spent run. an hour on that particular topic. I want to take us to another piece of... Um, a problem that the new Prime Minister has in his inbox and talk to uh, Stephen Fairley, who's an old friend of the programme in Dumbarton. Stephen, um, I think you've got uh, another problem for Mr Sunak. Well, Trevor, I think, um, as, you probably, as you probably know from my previous um, mentions on the, on the programme, I mean, uh, the Tories have no mandate in Scotland. I mean, it's the 10th Tory MP we've had a Tory Prime Minister we've had since 1955. Um, and he has, no, he has no mandate in Scotland. It's just more of the same for the people of Scotland. It's going to be austerity, arrogance, okay. falsehoods and contempt for the voters of Scotland. So you've got a and question for our panel? I do. I mean, in the, eyes, in the eyes of the world, is the UK looking more foolish or do we already look foolish? Ian Martin. Well, I'm, you know, detecting a sort of pro-independence, uh, you know, tone to that question. Yeah, I didn't. And, you need to be Sherlock Holmes to get that. Yeah, and as a, <laughs> and as, a, as, a as a unionist, I would say with respect, I'd, I, I hear that concern about mandate in Scotland, but I think the very last thing that w that makes sense at the moment is to do something which is ten times, a hundred times worse than trussism, which is to a attempt to leave the United Kingdom, set up a central bank, use the pound create havoc on the markets and make Scotland much poorer. So I don't think independence is the answer. Actually, I think in terms of Scotland, what seems to be happening is the Labour Party is probably coming back. And I think an interesting thing in Scotland will be if, if voters start to get the idea you don't, you don't always have a Tory government yes. 
in, inflicted, and the the revival of the Labour Party in Scotland may may actually um, spell disaster for the SNP long term. We'll see. Okay. Boris Johnson made four visits to Kyiv when he was Prime Minister. He made firm commitments every time to help Ukraine in the fight against the Kremlin. A little earlier, I spoke to the former president, Petro Poroshenko, to find out how he's feeling about a Rishi Sunak premiership. He began by paying tribute to his friend, Boris Johnson. First of all, Boris Johnson uh, is a very great friend of mine and very great friend of Ukraine. And uh, I want to use this opportunity, Boris, if you see me on the TV, I want to... We'll make sure he's watching. I hope so. And I want to uh, really grateful for your efforts since your uh, ministerial position of the foreign secretary uh, as a prime minister. And uh, I want to use this opportunity that uh, to congratulate uh, Mr. Rishi Sunak. Uh, and uh, I absolutely appreciate that this is the position of the whole British people. The whole British people supporting Ukraine, the whole uh, bipartisan support of the British Parliament, British government, and all British Prime Minister, because this is war of Putin not against Ukraine. This is the war of Putin against whole free world, whole democracy, including the Britain. And during the last uh, statement of Putin, he do not use any more Ukraine. He said. He is fighting with the Anglo-Saxon Anglo uh, yeah. world. And I am proud that we are part of the Anglo-Saxon world to stopping the Russian aggressor, threw him away from here. And I am a respect of the British democracy and choice of the British people. And uh, for me, it is uh, no difference. It is Boris Johnson, it... Rishi Sunak, uh, Prime Minister Truss, or anybody else. I am okay. count on the British, United Kingdom and the British people. Well, you will have to deal with uh, Mr Sunak. If you were in conversation with him tonight, what would you be saying to him that the Ukrainian people need and want from Britain now? First of all, I want to congratulate him. Second, I just want to remind that uh, Rishi Sunak promised to pay a visit, his first international visit to Kyiv. And I know Rishi Sunak as a political leader, very young and very promising political leader who all the time keep his promises. Mr. Prime Minister, congratulations with the leadership in the Conservative Party in the leadership of the British government, and we are waiting for you in Kiev. Please, let's your first visit because this is having a, a very important symbolic uh, importance of the uh, first visit. And what we are waiting from him, the leadership in the world, together with the United States, together with the European Union, leadership in supplying the weapons. Yep. to Ukraine. And I'm proud that also my non-governmental organizations supply to the armed forces of Ukraine a lot of the uh, British uh, yep. army uh, things, including these DAF cars. This is from Great Britain. The and ones behind I'm you. Really... Yeah, right behind okay. me. And with that situation, we wait in weapons, no. we wait in sanction and embargo, we wait in Marshall Plan Second Edition, we wait in the global anti-Putin coalition with the British leadership, and we wait in the future membership of Ukraine in NATO. Okay. And sorry about that, but future membership of Ukraine in the European Union. Petro Poroshenko, let's speak to Debbie. Debbie Lenton in Plymouth, Debbie, briefly, what's your, what's your thought about where we've got to tonight? Um, I, I'm just surprised that who voted Liz in, firstly, was it the same ones who voted her out? Um, that's a big shot for six weeks, to be quite honest. You're surprised that... that could you say that again, please, Debbie? I didn't quite hear. Who voted Liz Trust in? Ah. 
was it the same people who voted her out? Would you have preferred if, uh, if the Conservative Party had stuck with Boris Johnson? Yes. Yeah, definitely. I think he did an awful lot, to be honest. Um, he got us out of Brexit, which he said he would do. Okay. He ruled out all the COVID jabs pretty quickly and efficiently. And he's helped with the Ukraine war. So he's had quite a lot to deal with, to be fair. OK, Debbie, that's, that's evoked quite a lot of reaction from our viewers panel. So I am going to take a test of opinion now. Mm -hmm. um, didn't expect this, but let's, let's see if we can do this. I want to ask who would have liked tonight to see Boris Johnson heading back to number 10? Let's not worry about the process, but if he had been able to win. Who would want to see Boris Johnson back in number 10 Downing Street this week? Those Hands up. Those who wanted Boris Johnson back. I think, I think that actually, Debbie, you are in a small but courageous minority there. <laughs> about <laughs> about ten, ten percent. Um, Robert Jenrick, was it so implausible? I mean, uh, prime ministers have come back. Uh, they've come back into the. They've come back into the uh, cabinet. Alec Douglas Hume came back. Mm -hmm after having been Prime Minister, to serve as Foreign Secretary? I didn't think it was the right time for Boris Johnson to return. There might be an opportunity in the future, but I felt that it was wrong to do it now. There was a reason that Boris's government came to an end, okay. and some of those issues are still unresolved, including an uh, investigation by the Privileges Committee in Parliament. I thought it was better to look forward and have somebody new in the form of Rishi Sunak, albeit somebody with a lot of experience who the public uh, are comfortable with. Just to answer yep. the point that you heard from uh, Petro Poroshenko, I, I do think that Rishi will take his responsibility to continue carrying the torch okay. of freedom for Ukraine very seriously. He would like to visit okay. Ukraine as quickly as possible, and he has been very involved in those efforts on the economic side. Now he'll work very closely with the Defence and Foreign Secretary on okay. the international diplomatic angle. Okay, as well. may I just ask you a quick question, and you may only answer yes or no to this. Did you believe that Boris Johnson got over 100 votes? I was skeptical of that, okay. I have to say. But I'll, I'll I'll take I have no, no insight. I'll take that as a no. Let's go, let's go back to Jamie Martin. Jamie, you have, a, you have a question for our panel in Beeston. Yeah, I do. Go. Um, yeah, to be honest, I'm, um, I'm sick of pie politics. And, yeah, the country needs to be put first. So I do want to ask this question. Will the Prime Minister put the country before the Conservative Party? Thank you. Um, th th this is a sort of obvious sitter for you, Tangham, but uh, honestly, you know this person, just speaking not as an opponent, but as a fellow parliamentarian. So what I heard this afternoon when Rishi made his first speech as the new leader of the Conservative Party is that throughout the speech he used a verbal device where he, spent, he talked about the Conservative Party first and the country second. And he, he made his priority in that first opening speech, the Conservative Party. I don't think that's good enough, but I'm afraid to say it's not really about Rishi Sunak anymore. It's a revolving door of chaos, and that's not going to bring stability. Okay. I, I, don't, I actually think that most okay. politicians go to, to become MPs because they want to do the best for their country, but I'm not seeing that from Rishi Sunak, and that, yeah. neither did I from any of the previous Tory Prime Ministers. Jill Russell, a non-partisan observer. Mm. What do you think? I think that... It, Ultimately, what depends is the extent to which Rishi Sunak gets that actually he best serves his party interests in the long term by putting the country's interests mm -hmm. first. I mean, he's inheriting, as Ian keeps saying, exactly. a really terrible economic situation. Mm -hmm. um, he's got to start sorting that out. It may be that he's sorting it out and ends up handing over a better economic legacy to the Labour Party, to Keir Starmer. I mean, that's after all... I was in number 10... Uh, when we had Black Wednesday, John Major then spent the next five years trying to sort of mm. restore the public finances, taking some very difficult decisions, ended up handing over really quite a good legacy to Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. So I don't think that the two interests are as separate as this suggests now. I don't, th I don't think he's going to have any choice because the stuff that he's going to have to do is going to, is going to be so unpopular. I mean, there are not going to be massive spending cuts. There are going to be very big tax rises. 
There's no other way to do it. That's what's coming, and he's going to have to level with people and tell people that, because borrowing isn't an option. Spending cuts won't be tolerated mm. by the public in terms of uh, public services, the NHS, welfare. There is only one place to go, and that is much higher taxes. Very difficult in a recession. It's going to be really mm. tough, but he doesn't have an alternative. But he's uh, OK. He's... And I, I think uh, there's a big elephant in the room that he's going to have to deal with, which I want to come to in a moment. But first, we'll go to the break. This is the great debate. Some believe that the last few months have shown that Brexit was a mistake. Does that need to be corrected if we are to see the economy prosper? Now, one thing that's been striking in this leadership race is how little the runners have told us about what they'd actually do in office. This morning, one of the Conservative Party's donors, the investor Guy Hans, said the economy was doomed unless the government renegotiates Brexit. So is it time to look again towards Europe? Let's talk to Neil Redlovich. And, Neil, you have a question for our panel. Good evening, Trevor. Good evening. Uh, Brexit has been a disaster for the nation, the Northern Ireland Protocol, the side of the bus slogan, the promises it will be seamless, the money saved for the NHS, a broken promise of voting no in the Scottish referendum will secure your EU future, all of which have failed to come to fruition. We have gone from a stable country to one on the brink of bankruptcy. So my question is, don't we need to change the Brexit deal that was negotiated by Boris Johnson in order to move on? Thank you very much indeed, Neil. Neil's question there. Do we need to renegotiate the Brexit deal in order to move on? Jill Rutter. Not for me to say whether you need to renegotiate the Brexit deal, but if you want to help the economy grow, I think you want to avoid the threat of a trade war with the EU, which means I think you need to try and find a negotiated solution to the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's what Rishi Sunak, as with Liz Truss, said they want to do, but that will take some compromising and some political footwork to actually deliver that. Uh, but it also may mean facing down some of the hardline Brexiters in the Conservative Party. You could look again at elements of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement to see where you could ease things for doing business. And I think if you want to act immediately, tomorrow the Commons is having its second reading of a thing called the Retained EU Law Bill, which actually would make the Northern Ireland Protocol harder to operate rather than easier and gives the government really quite sweeping powers to take a lot of EU laws off the statute book. There's undoubtedly yeah. areas where we can do regulation better uh, than the EU did it, but that uh, creates a lot of business uncertainty. The, the, and, the, the government, of course, yeah. argues that that bill is a natural consequence of the decision uh, to leave, uh, and it's just uh, essentially tidying up. But, Thang Debonair, let, let me ask you, where is Labour on this, actually? Uh, I know the slogan is, make Brexit work. It's a good but slogan. do you agree that there should be a renegotiation, for example, to get uh, Britain back into um, what used to be the common market? Uh, well, the common market as, as a concept doesn't exist anymore, but we want to make our relationship with the European Union work. And that is how you make Brexit work. You do put in the hard graph that is necessary to sort out problems with the Northern Ireland But what Protocol. does it look like at the end? Well, do we bring down tariffs? There do we have freedom no, of movement? There is no end what? to that relationship. And the, 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 the way we want to end up is a relationship where we have a strong trading agreement with our nearest neighbours and partners, where we work with them on areas of mutual interest, such as scientific research, the climate crisis that we're in at the moment, it's shared tackling of crime, such as ta uh, terrorism and, and other threats, there where we've got mutual right. areas where we need to work together. Sorting out okay. a way of doing all of those things is essential and would help improve our relationships with the European Union, Ian, which we are going to need to do if we want to make Ian, Brexit work, which we will have to do. Ian Martin, is that um, possible? It's possible, but I... You, look, I voted for Brexit, but I think it is a denial of reality... Uh, those hardline Brexiteers who say that it's working and there's no problem. Yes, it's exactly. clearly a problem. It's clearly a barrier to trade. And I think the story of the next 10 years or so is a story of moving back to a closer relationship with the European Union. I don't think I wouldn't want to rejoin the European Union. Imagine the renegotiation. Mm. Imagine the terms set. Imagine the referendum. We don't want to go mm. through all that again. But I think it will fall... Maybe it falls to the next oh. Labour government... Or maybe yep. it falls to Rishi Sunak, who did vote for Brexit. Yep. There has to be an adult conversation about this and better trade and better ties with the EU.
Robert Jenrick, uh, you can... I, I don't want to ask you whether you agree with that. I think she'll probably sympathetic to that point of view. The question I want to ask is this specifically. Can you imagine members of your party who have stood out against virtually any kind of rapprochement with the EU, the so-called Spartans, the Suella Bravermans and so on, actually agreeing to the sort of thing that Ian Martin has just spoken of? Well, I'd say it was firstly quite striking this weekend that Rishi Sunak received the support of Suella Braverman, Steve Baker, David Davis, Liam Fox, a number of the most prominent Brexiteers in the current Conservative Party. I think there is sign of hope that the relationship between the UK and Ireland, for example, has improved yeah. significantly. If, if I may I think... interrupt you, though, they, they will have come to that conclusion for a whole series of reasons. What I really want to ask you is the people who are, belong to the European mm. Research Group that, who made Theresa well, 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 May's the life hell. Most of the Do you people think I just there's any possibility they will ever agree or countenance that sort of deal? Well, most of the people I just mentioned are members of the European Research Group. And I think if you look at, say, Steve Baker, who is a Northern Ireland minister, he seems to be making considerable progress on building a more productive relationship with Ireland that may help us to resolve some of the remaining tensions. I would like us to have a pragmatic approach. Of course we want to defend the integrity of the United Kingdom, the ability of goods and services to okay. operate you know, free, freely through the uh, common market of the United Kingdom, but I do okay. think that can be done in a pragmatic way, and Rishi's okay. election provides okay. us with an opportunity to build right. those better relationships. Five seconds. A rare word of praise for Liz Truss. She joined something called the European Political Community, which is dedicated to security cooperation within, within uh, Euro Europe. So that's a start. Mm. OK. Thank you very much indeed. That's all we have time for this evening. It just remains for me to say thank you to our panellists here in the studio. Pangam Debonair, Ian Martin, Jill Rutter and Robert Jenrick. Of course, it's you at home who are always at the centre of our conversations. And if you'd like to be part of the programme next time, you can get in touch by writing or emailing to thegreatdebate at sky.uk. And for now, I want to thank our viewers panel, thoughtful and incisive as always. Thank you so much. And you at home, keep talking. We'll see you again at the same time next week for The Great Debate.